Hello. This week we're hearing what's planned for this year's Black Mental Health Summit. We'll hear from an organizer and one of the keynote speakers. And there's a new pharmacy at East Liberty making it convenient for lots of people to get the meds they need. We'll talk to the nonprofit. Plus, three young men are using their time and talents to show middle and high school boys what it means to be future kings. They'll explain how it works. So pull up a chair and meet me at the corner. Intersection starts right now. I'm Lisa Smith, the Director of Community Impact at KDKA Plus and the host of Intersections. This year marks the third year in a row for NAMI Keystone Pennsylvania's Black Mental Health Summit. It's an event that brings the community together to look at the impact of trauma on the black community and ways to find healing. Joining us to discuss this event are Alita Barnett. She is the Director of Mental Health Equity and Community Engagement with NAMI Keystone Pennsylvania and Dr. Erica Givner, the owner of Vision Towards Peace Counseling Services and one of the keynote speakers for the event. Welcome ladies to Intersections. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. So um, third year, Alita, for this event, when it started a couple of years ago, um, what was the idea behind it then and how has it evolved? Yeah, so um, three years ago, we had our first event at the Kingsley Center. Um, only about 50 people. So the idea was just to bring community together to talk about the issues that were important in the black community. So since then, it's obviously grown. Um, this will be our third year, as you mentioned. Um, every year is getting bigger. Um, we have brought in more keynote speakers. And, you know, originally we had it set up kind of as a conversation. Um, but now we're able to, you know, really give the community this information, um, still have the conversation, mm -hmm. and just actually have people there with resources on hand. So yeah. super excited about that. And then Dr. Givner, yeah. you're there this year. You're one of the keynote speakers. What are, what are some of the topics that you feel like you want to make sure that you address uh, during this event? So um, the topic that I want to be able to address is the uh, mental health in the black community along with the stigma that um, that unfortunately goes with the black community when they're looking to seek outpatient or inpatient mental health care and so I want to be able to talk about breaking um, the ideas around the stigma trauma and creating a, sp a safe space and helping people to understand that access and therapy is not what it used to be and be able to create a space for them to understand that um, we are able to open up and speak now and giving people that opportunity to do just that. Yeah, because you basically this is kind of coming from, you know, you hear we hear a lot in the black community that, you know, we oh we don't go to counseling mm -hmm. or that we don't need counseling. <laughs> um, but that's not true. Right. Yeah. Right. Tell me tell me why that's not true and how hard is it to change that that line of thinking. Right, so I'm pretty sure often we hear so much around the stigma with mental health and what goes on in this house stays in this house and what that thinking has done to a lot of people. One of my many sayings that I uh, appreciate saying is um, silence, breed, um, silence breed harm, right? And so being able to break that silence, being able to address what goes on in this house no longer works today and being able to allow people to come and talk about how their trauma and how um, past, how disparities and things has impacted their home, impacted how they think and how they be able to care for their family and their community. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanna be able to address those things. Yeah, tell us a little bit about your background. Like how did you get into counseling? <laughs> yeah, so um, again, I'm the owner of Vision Towards Peace Counseling Services. We're located in Wilkinsburg and I've been doing this for the last couple decades. And so it's just something that I love to do. Um, I feel like my life makes sense. I'm, I've gone through so many things in my own life and I have a lot of li lived experiences to help people um, go up against and let them see that they, don't, they no longer have to be a part of that space of status quo and live in such disparity and allowing their traumas to continue to dictate the outcomes of their life. Yeah. So Alita, you know, third year, like we said earlier, it seems like it's growing. 
Um, but are, is there a change in the need? Is the need the same as it was a couple of years ago? And are the resources there mm. for people who need them? Yeah, I think um, the need has always been the same. Just, uh, you know, be able to provide the community with resources, um, normalize the conversation around mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, so as Dr. Gibner mentioned, there's a huge stigma in our community, um, not only about, you know, seeking help, but just, you know, kind of admitting that something might be happening. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as we've grown, we're able to invite people, other agencies to come in um, and table with their own resources so we can have those things right at the summit and as people you know walk around they're able to meet people from these organizations and actually talk with people who are providing these resources yeah. so we want to again normalize the conversation um, really give the community the resources they need to be on this journey of healing yeah and and this is something that NAMI has really um, tried to tackle um, is are there things that NAMI is doing that is really tr starting to make a difference for some people. Mm. Absolutely. Um, well, we've created the African American Mental Health Resource Guide for Allegheny County, which is full of all black therapists, psychiatrists, and programming. Um, we believe that is at least one barrier that has been broken um, for people to seek help. Because we know, you know, if we have a service that someone that looks like us and understands our issues, a um, little bit more prone to reach out to those people. Mm -hmm. um, and also doing a lot of presentations yeah. um, within the community. So not just something as big as a summit, but just presenting to smaller groups, church groups. Um, actually presented to a woman, a quilting group of women um, that asked to come out and speak about mental health. So I think those things that people are reaching out and asking for this information yeah. really shows what we're doing is working. Yeah. Now, one of the other keynote speakers for this event mm -hmm. is Leon Ford, yes. and he has such an amazing story. Is that? I'm, I'm guessing that's why you invited him. Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, in Leon's story, he talks about the challenges and kind of how he was feeling before mm -hmm. he sought help. Mm -hmm. um, so the feelings of anger and all those things he was facing. So we really want him to hone in on kind of what shift and what change and what allowed him to start that healing journey himself. Yeah. So I think a lot of people, once they hear that and kind of understand his story, then they might be more prone to say, I think I can get help too. Yeah, well, this sounds like a really amazing event, of course, right? And so we wanna show people um, where it is, how they can go and things like that. So it's again, the Black Mental Health Summit uh, with Keystone, uh, it's not me Keystone PA. It is Wednesday, July 10th. Is that correct? Yes. So All Wednesday, right. July 10th uh, from 10 to 2. Doors open up at 9.30. Um, we do have registration. It is filling up fast. Um, so we encourage people to go on our website, the NAMI Keystone PA.org. Um, and there you will find um, how to register. Okay. Sounds good. Well, ladies, thank you so much thank for you. coming out and sharing this information. And much success for the event. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank All right. you. All right. Well, coming up, we are talking to leaders of a nonprofit that just opened a new pharmacy in East Liberty. Intersections. We'll be right back. At a time when several pharmacies in our area and across the country are closing their doors, there is now a new pharmacy in East Liberty. Allies Pharmacy is now open. It's part of the care being offered by Allies for Health and Wellbeing, which initially was formed almost 40 years ago as the Pittsburgh AIDS Task Force. Joining me now to talk about this new service is Shonda Young. He is the CEO of Allies for Health and Wellbeing. Welcome to Intersections. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for having me on your show. I really Really appreciate it. Oh, well, I appreciate you and, coming. And, and amplifying that. But you are correct. Uh, 2025 will be the 40th anniversary of our organization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we began as Pittsburgh AIDS Task Force. Mm -hmm. So our, our primary focus has been um, caring for individuals living with or affected by HIV um, and it continues to be a focus. So, you know, one of our biggest services <clears throat> is our Ryan White. Uh, CARES Act program, which provides medical case management to people living with uh, HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, we touch about 900 people a year in our 11 county region. Um, but in that service, aside from medical case management, we provide housing assistance, emergency financial assistance, a food yeah. pantry program, behavioral health services, a pharmacy program that's a mail order pharmacy. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then about eight years ago, we opened up a health clinic on site. Yeah. And the initial focus of the health clinic was to focus on individuals living with or affected by HIV. Um, and then that expanded to prevention of HIV. So providing LGBTQ competent care mm -hmm. to prevent the transmission. Also care for individuals that are affected by STIs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we added um, basic gynecological services as well. Yeah. So it's a full service clinic. Yeah. Um, and as you mentioned, there are a number of pharmacies that are closing mm -hmm. um, that have been affected by a lot of different environmental things, such as, you know, manufacturer clawbacks and insurance and whatnot. Yeah. But we felt like it was a really important step for us to become more fully integrated in our care model. Um, we still have our mail order pharmacy. We use another organization for that, but we thought it was really, really important that we continue to wrap around the people that are coming to our, our site for care so they can come and see their case manager or they can come and see their physician or their, you know, see the nurse and pick up their medication before they leave. Yeah. Now, is this something that they have been asking for, that the patients have been asking for, or was it just the, the next, you know, step in the evolution of what the care is that you guys are offering? Well, we certainly talked to our patients about it, so they were excited about the prospect of having the on-site pharmacy. Um, but it's sort of the evolution in, you know, the care model that we are part of across the country, people that provide care for, for people living with HIV. Mm -hmm. um, for, you know, convenience, having, you know, the same pharmacist that they can d develop a relationship with. Yeah. Um, you know, and we're still a very small organization. So, you know, our pharmacy is pretty small. Um, I do want to um, highlight, though, that the pharmacy is in East Liberty, but it is for our patients. Right, um, so they have to already be affiliated, need, yes. Yeah, they need to come in and get care, but anybody can come in and get health care. They just need to, to come in and, and um, do an intake and, and, and come and get care. So, you know, we serve, you know, the East Liberty community. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, you know, a few thousand patients now, mm -hmm. so we're growing. Uh, you know, when we started, we had four exam rooms. Now we have seven. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and have added a lot more providers, so it's it's really exciting seeing the evolution of the organization. Yeah, so we, you know we had talked earlier about you know the opening of this pharmacy. Um, one of the things that we talked about are the the medication needs, and then sometimes there are barriers that the patients have um, in maybe getting those those medications. Sure. Talk about um, how this pharmacy will help alleviate some of those barriers. So one of the amazing things about being in the healthcare space we're in, um, we qualify for a government pricing program to purchase our medication, um, you know, and we bill retail for it, so we earn profit. So if there's a barrier, an insurance barrier, we can get people insured. If they are uninsured and need care, we cover the cost of that care. Mm -hmm. um, if they can't afford their medication, we can cover the cost of that medication. So we put the money right back in to the people that we're serving and the community that we're serving. It also really helps our community health program, which does a lot of the prevention work that goes out into the community to find individuals that are, you know, to test individuals that mm -hmm. might be at risk for HIV or STIs, and then bring them into care um, so that they're not languishing out in the community and not knowing what their status is. And that's really the key message that we try to, to uh, press to the community is please know your status. Come and get tested. We offer free testing on site six days a week. Mm -hmm. We do testing out in the community um, and anybody can come in and get tested. Yeah. So, and if you know your status um, and you happen to be HIV positive, we can identify that right away and get people on their medication to treat the HIV. Yeah. And the key piece to that is if we can get people to an undetectable viral load for HIV, they can't transmit the virus. Mm -hmm. It's like 99.5% or something like that. Um, and that goes back, yes. back to the medications. Yes. Yeah, it, the medica it that's how essential those medications are. It absolutely are. does. And, and you know, we've come so far in this country with the quality of medications to treat HIV. Um, I'm sure you see commercials on TV for Bictarvi. But now we have injectable medications. Cabinuva, 
for HIV, and Apertude for pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. Um, there's also a once a day pill that you can take for PrEP mm -hmm. called Discovy. But the injectables are every other month um, you get an injectable. So you get six shots a year and it is amazingly effective. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate you coming and sharing about this new pharmacy that's available in the community. And hopefully we'll have you come back to talk about some other things you're doing. We appreciate I would, it. I would love to. Uh, again, I just uh, appreciate you amplifying what we're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, we, like I said, we serve 11 counties, so we're ever present. Okay. <laughs> and I would love to come back. All right. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Open invitation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Well, coming up, three young men paving the way for other young boys to be future kings. Intersections. We'll be right back. Getting young boys to see their future selves, achieving their dreams, setting high goals, and surrounded by positivity. That's the goal of a local nonprofit set up by three friends in college. Future Kings Mentoring is working to impact the lives of young African-American male students in Pittsburgh. And here to share what they're doing are Terrell Galloway. He is the co-founder and president. Sean Spencer is co-founder and treasurer, and Israel Williams is co-founder and secretary. Welcome all of you to Intersections. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah, you for having us here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Terrell, let's just start with you. Tell us a little bit about, you know, um, Future Kings Mentoring, you know, how you guys got started and what you do. Yes, so the organization, the ideology, started way back when myself and Sean were in high school. Uh, we created the name Future Kings Mentoring, the logo and the ideology. And since then, it has blossomed into a program with 20 students in middle school and high school each year. And with this, we do confidence building. Then we talk about financial literacy, helping our students understand saving, budgeting, investing. And then the last thing we do is college and career prep. We have our students be exposed to as many things as possible, cooking, changing attire, STEM, as many activities as possible to learn what they want to do after high school. So Sean, tell me a little bit by, about why this was something that you found to be important, why you wanted to do this. It was needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the three of our backgrounds, we grew up in single parent households, grew up in low income neighborhoods, and the reality is that not only we saw the struggles of our own mothers, as well as the value of being put in mentor programs, and our mentors even taught us the value of giving back. And the reality is that and my mentality has always been, if I don't, who will? Yeah. So, Israel, tell me about, you know, what the kids are like and what is it like engaging with these young guys? It is fantastic and very uplifting. Mm -hmm. um, each of our mentees brings their own unique personality and energy. It's, it's a good reminder of what it was like to be their age and to have dreams and to have hope. And like Sean said, um, it's, it's nice to fill that need because they all come in ready to support each other and ready to build a community. And it's been a blessing to be able to foster that environment. Yeah. Uh, Terrell, you know, a lot of times we see the black male image that is not positive. Mm. Um, what does it mean to have this image for these young guys? Um, and how does that compare to images that you saw when you were growing up? Yes. So that is a big part of why we created the program. It's just that representation really matters. And we've seen within our students that shift in mentality of I can't to now I will. And that's my own personal story. I didn't really think I could become an engineer, which I am now. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew very young I wanted to be a rehabilitation robotics engineer. Told my mom that and let her know also that I couldn't become one, you know? And I asked her to name me one black engineer, but she couldn't. So she made it her mission to change that mentality, put me in the National Society of Black Engineers Junior Chapter, determined that day I will become an engineer. Graduated from the University of Pittsburgh as a mechanical engineer. Now we have some of our students doing that same type of transition. Mm -hmm. One of our students is actually at Pitt right now being a mechanical engineer, and he had that shift just because of our program and that change in confidence. Wow, and you all had mentors growing up, so that's kind of how this came about. Sean, tell me about your mentor. Oh, wow, so I was a member of the Journey to Medicine Mentor Program, and Mr. Morris Turner um, and, and the whole Gateway Medical Society, their goal was to expose black males to the medical field because we're like under 5% if not 2% for black men specifically in the medical field, right? And so while I'm not, I'm not a doctor here, <laughs> however, seeing them, you know physicians are busy, 
seeing them take the time out of their busy schedules to mm -hmm. give back to me, expose me to new experiences, but as well as uh, show me what leadership looks like, show me that I can and that I will. Yeah. Quickly, your mentor, Israel? Uh, one of my mentors in my life has been Daryl Wiley. He's an executive director at FAME, Funded for the Advancement of Minorities Through Education. But I met him um, in Nesby Jr., the National Society of Black Engineers Jr. Um, he w is not an engineer by degree, but he absolutely shared this quote that I want to share with you. Mm -hmm. And it was, he may not change the world, but he can touch the mind that will. Mm -hmm. And so that was very inspiring for me when I was, I guess, 13, 14 years old. Yeah. Well, you guys are ready to take a whole new group. <laughs> So tell us a little bit um, about the, this new uh, group that you are ready to register. You're, you're accepting registration right now, Terrell. Correct. Uh, people can go to apply and learn more about the organization at futurekingsmentoring.org. And there's an application page right there. Students can actually apply. And we're accepting about 10 to 15 students this year. You have until July 30th to put in the application. After the application is done, we do a very quick interview just to understand can you actually make the commitment. We meet at the Shady Side Boys and Girls Clubs, October through June, every Sunday. This year though, we're adding in additional programming throughout the week. So you'll be seeing Future Kings two more days throughout the week. Awesome, so. awesome. And then we got 30 seconds. Um, Sean, what do you do now? I currently work at, in the tech industry. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Pittsburgh with my MBA, and I also do Future Kings mentoring. All right, and Israel? Of my nine to five, I'm an inside sales engineer at Meco, a company in Cranberry Township. And outside of that, I do mentoring and I'm involved with my community. All right. And Terrell, you're engineering as well? I but just made the switch to Carnegie Mellon University, getting my MBA, and I'm currently interning at Diageo in New York. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for being here and for everything that you're doing. We appreciate it. And we have one thank you for oh. you. So we do <laughs> entrepreneurship, and this is something oh. that our students came up with. Oh, awesome. That's so nice. Thank you. I will definitely use it. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. And I will have my last word when we come back. Freedom. There are some freedoms that are the foundation of this country. Freedom of speech, assembly, religion, the press. Freedom to seek redress of grievances. In essence, those First Amendment freedoms were just the start. Centuries later, the fight for more freedoms continue because attaining freedom is a long process. It takes time, comes at a cost, and requires protection. So let's not take it for granted. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Intersections.